Friends, I hope you are well and healthy. For your info, I have just received my second vaccine dose this week. And a reminder to all of us that we still have to be vigilant and observe SOP for our sake and the sake of our community. Now, some of you are asking when we will have in-person celebration again. Well, we have a set of criteria to decide when we should do that, and we will do so when appropriate, and you will be informed in due course. And if you are our visitor, I, I want to, on behalf of the church, warmly welcome you. And I hope one day to have a cup of coffee with you at our welcome lounge in Dream Center and, and look forward to that day. Now, we are continuing on the series of Jesus is Better from the book of Hebrews. And today we come to chapter 8, Jesus, the mediator of a better covenant. So why don't we stand up right now and hold up our Bible. As always, it's our custom to honor the Word of God. So can you do that right now? Lift up your Bible. Are you ready to say, this is my Bible? Okay, one, two, go. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It informs my mind, inspires my heart, and instructs my behavior. So help me, God. And let's read from two passages of Scripture from Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 to 2 and 10 to 13. So if you can read aloud together with me uh, from the screen, uh, and uh, we want to be able to declare the Word of God. Are you ready? Right, ready? One, two, go. Now the main point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord not by a mere human being. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write to them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come once again, Lord, to illumine our minds. Give us an understanding of Scripture like never before, so that, Lord, it will help us to be a better disciple of Jesus Christ. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Now, this letter of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians who had grown up under the law and later they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and converted out of Judaism. And they were facing persecutions from the Roman authorities as well as from their own Jewish families who are still in Judaism. Actually, it was easier and more convenient for them to escape persecutions and hardship just by simply going back to Judaism. After all, they worship the same God, they could argue, uh, but the writer of Hebrews passionately pleaded with them to say, don't go back. Jesus is so much better. He was urging them to keep moving forward in their faith. Now, it's like having this, and then going back to this. You see, no one wants to go back to an older version when you have the latest and newest it's the same argument in Hebrews about the Old and New Covenant. And here's the big idea. It's finished. It's all done. Christ is enough. Let me repeat. It's finished. It's all done. Christ is enough. And let me unpack this for you with these three key points. The minister, the ministry, and the meaning of the New Covenant. So let me start with the first one, the minister of the new covenant from verses 1 to 7. And as a writer began to talk about this new covenant, he started first by summarizing what he had been saying so far about Jesus as the high priest. And Hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 to 2 says, Now the main point of what we are saying is this, We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. So what was he doing? Seated. He is at rest. He is not walking, kneeling, 
or pacing around in heaven, but seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. And in the earthly tabernacle, there was no chair for the priest because his work was never done in the ongoing sacrifices. But here, Jesus is seated. You see, Jesus is not trying to argue our case with God. The price is paid. Nothing more needs to be said or done. It's a done deal. You know, in Chinese, we say, Gao Tim. So when we pray, we cannot say, Save us more, Lord, or more of your Holy Spirit. We cannot ask Him to give us more peace or more fruit of the Spirit because He has already given it all to us. The problem is us surrendering or yielding our lives more to Him. It's like you being really thirsty and right in front of God is this huge unending stream of fresh water. And then you say, give me more water, Lord. But it's there. Drink from it. Drink as much as you need. Now, what's the problem here? See, the problem is that you are not going to Him and drink from that stream. The act of providing this stream of water is done. It cannot be more one than what it already is. Salvation is the same thing. And verse 3 says this, Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. You see, the job of the high priest is to offer animal sacrifices on behalf of the people to God. In this case, Jesus offered himself as the perfect lamb for sacrifice. He shed his blood. And verse 4 says, If he were on earth, he would not be a priest. For there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. So it was rather interesting for the writer to note that if Jesus was on earth, he couldn't be a high priest because it is not in his genes as he is from the tribe of Judah and not Levi. But from the previous chapter, he said Jesus is a different kind of priest. He goes on to describe the earthly tabernacle, verse 5. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. And this is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Now, the mountain here was Mount Sinai, where God gave the law and inaugurated the old covenant. See, the earthly tabernacle, the tent that traveled with the people of God, symbolized the presence of God. But it is a photocopy and a shadow of the real tabernacle that is in heaven. So when we get to heaven, we'll see the exact real thing. In heaven, you will have an aha moment. Oh, wow, I see it now. Before this, you saw a photocopy, but wow, I see it now. It's like doing your research on the places that you're about to visit. One of those memorable holiday trips which my wife and I went to was to Rome and Venice. And it is such an amazing historical place. And I'm glad we did some research and reading to pre prepare us for these on-site visits. And what we saw on the websites of these places paled in comparison when we saw them in their real form. It was so much more beautiful and breathtaking. And these website photos were merely shadows of the real thing. Now, in the same way, when you understand the earthly tabernacle as a shadow, you will really appreciate the real thing when you see it. And you will have this aha moment. Wow, I see it now. Then he comes to this main point, verse 6. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. And so this is the meat of our sermon today. The new covenant that Jesus inaugurated at the Last Supper, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, where it says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So tell you what, each time you partake of the Holy Communion, you are proclaiming the new covenant that you have received. So do you know what this new covenant promises are? 
Wouldn't it make a difference if you knew what Jesus did for you rather than just merely going through the Holy Communion as a ritual? You need to therefore listen very carefully to the next part if you want to have a more meaningful Holy Communion. The writer makes a very blunt point. He's saying the new is just way, way better than the old. It is superior. There's no comparison. Why so? Now notice the end of verse 6. The new covenant is established on better promises. So let me say this startling statement. You can have a new covenant faith, but stuck in living an old covenant life. Let me repeat that. You can have a new covenant faith, but stuck living an old covenant life. Now, if as a Christian, you're feeling miserable in the rut and feeling trapped, there's a good chance you're stuck in old covenant living, although you have a new covenant faith. So here's a chance for us to renew our minds in this matter. Now, let's follow his argument with the Jewish Christians if we ourselves have been living wrongly like them. Now, verse 7, this is what he says. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. So Jesus came as the minister of a new covenant, mediating on our behalf with God for his forgiveness and acceptance, not through our good works, but the cross. And here, the second point is the ministry, therefore, of the new covenant from verses 8 and 9. Here, the writer quoted from Jeremiah uh, chapter 33, verses 31 to 32. In verse 8 of chapter 8 Hebrews, But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. The promise of God to the Jews was that there will be a new covenant. And Jesus came and redefined this in John chapter 10 that his sheep will consist of Jews and Gentiles, which means everyone on earth qualify to be part of the new covenant, and they are called the church. In verse 9, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. And the writer said emphatically, The new is different from the old. It's a completely new model. The old covenant was about a religious life by performance and good works, trying to be good enough for God. But we know we will fail because of our sinful nature. You see, the law was just there simply to reveal how far short we are from God's standard. The new covenant is much better. It focuses on what Jesus, the Messiah, has done for you. It has nothing to do with what you have done to save yourself because we will never be good enough. So what did Jesus do on Calvary? He opened the way to God. Regardless of whether I read my Bible this morning, whether I went to church last Sunday, whether I'm tithing or giving or worshipping or serving, Those are not the issues. I think I've got your attention now. Your ears are perked up. This is pastor speaking about something you have been feeling very guilty about. So the minister of the old covenant, the ministry, and now the third thing is the meaning of the new covenant from verses 10 to 13. You see, when Christians don't understand this, they try to cram the old covenant into the new and try to make it work. So we ask ourselves, how is the new covenant different from the old? You see, the old covenant established through Moses had many good promises. If you were to read through the Old Testament, you will see that God promised the Israelites they would be blessed in the land they were going to, the promised land. A land flowing with milk and honey. Their enemies with an overwhelming military size would be defeated. The rains would fall in season, The sun will shine, their crops will grow, their children will be strong and free, there will be peace, there will be rejoicing in the abundance of the land. They will no longer go hungry. There will always be a roof over their head, etc., etc., etc. And they were really good things to enjoy in the promised land. Who doesn't wonder that? 
But you will also notice something else about all these old covenant promises. There is no provision for eternity and for heaven. This may be new to you. <laughs> they were actually, the promises were all for this life on earth. If you follow these laws, the Bible says, you will be blessed on this earth. Otherwise, there will be curses for disobedience and the curses were also laid out in Scripture. So the, the Jews got mixed up along the way, so much so that by the time Jesus came onto the scene, they were fully convinced that heaven was attainable by keeping the law. But the law does not have provision for eternity. But the, so the Jews made it up by imposing a very rigorous system of religious works to be good enough for God. Now, do you know that God never promises great crops, that our enemies wouldn't overwhelm us, or that we will never fall sick or suffer? Let's look at what he promised from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. It says there, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every spiritual blessing in Christ. It didn't say physical blessing. I'm not saying that he doesn't bless us with earthly blessings. Don't get me wrong there. And many of us can testify how good our Heavenly Father is in providing for all our needs. But I have concerns that many Christians focus about their earthly blessings rather than on the heavenly ones. And I get really concerned when Christians get into things like health and wealth doctrines that have crept into the church. It is shocking for me to hear that Christians are gullible enough to believe tally evangelists who tell them to invest $100 into the ministry and they'll receive $1,000 back. You see, this prosperity gospel is all about me, what I have in life and how much money I am making, what kind of car I'm driving and what kind of house I'm living in. You see, that's not the blessing that God promised in the new covenant. And I see Christians live by performance, almost like signing a contract and making a deal with God that if they do this, this and that, and God will have to do this, this and that. And God becomes a genie in the land. And they even use scriptures out of context when the scripture doesn't say so. And when things don't get their way, they will get so disappointed with God and then they backslide and complain about God. Now, this is old covenant living. The new covenant, listen to me carefully, is different. And it is not a covenant of obedience. And it is expressed in this way. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And then here comes the terms. What you need to do. It simply says that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And here's your turn. Whoever believes. Now, what does God do for you? You will not perish and he will grant you eternal life. You only need to believe. Now, I had mentioned before that our faith is not just about intellectually agreeing to a set of belief or doctrine. We know it is more than intellectually uh, agreeing. Even the devil believes and trembles, the Bible says. Many people will tell you that they believe in God, they even say they are Christian, but it doesn't mean they trust God. You see, real faith helps you to repent from your old way or old way of life and put your complete and total confidence in what Jesus did on the cross for you. It is to believe Christ alone is enough to save you from your sins when you repent. So the big idea again is finished. It's all done. Christ is enough. And Apostle Paul expressed the same terms in a, in a few passages. My favorite one is this from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, where it says, it, For it is by what? Grace. By grace that you have been saved through faith. And he goes on to say, in case you didn't get it the first time, and uh, taking from it from the Good News translation, it says, It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. It. Nothing that you will ever do will make you more acceptable to God. 
There's no boasting in heaven, by the way. There's no badges of honor where we have pastor or social worker, missionary, leader, philanthropist or prophet or intercessor and so on. We will only wear one badge and that badge is Jesus. You see, nobody can say I got to heaven because I did it right. See, some of you by now may be quite concerned that I seem to contradict the importance of obedience in our relationship with God. Now, li listen up to this. I'm, I don't mean that. It is also what Apostle Paul faced in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, where he says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means, Apostle Paul says. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? See, Paul heard the same concern that we think some people will go bananas and live however they want because they are already saved. His reply is simply, of course not, absolutely not. Now, one of the great blessings of the new covenant is that when we come to faith in Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. Now, look at the middle of verse 10. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. And this is prophet Jeremiah foretelling the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is something the Old Testament did not have, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in every believer. When we truly have the Holy Spirit in our lives, we start to what I call rearrange the furniture in our lives. And this is called the process of sanctification. He starts to change the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we act. He begins to do a transformation inside us. You see, the old covenant attempts to change the inside by outward performance. The new covenant, on the other hand, does it the other way around. We change from the inside out. Now, let me give you an example. You know our highway code that says you should not drive faster than 110 km per hour. Now, even if you know the law, do you think that you will keep at the right speed, all the time? <laughs> what happens when you see a warning ahead? There's a speed camera or a policeman with a radar gun. <laughs> we instinctively slow down, right? Why? Because we are afraid of the fines and also the demerit points and not because we value the lives of people. The law cannot change who you are inside. It merely exposes who you really are Inside. That's the purpose of the law. Obedience and holy living is important, but it is not the term of the covenant. You are not saved because you are more obedient. You are saved because of Christ. And here's you know, what you are saved for. And Paul said, Ephesians 2 verse 10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So maybe let me put it this way. You are not saved by good works, but you are saved for good works. Let me put it again. You are not saved by good works. You are saved for good works. You are not saved by your obedience, but you are saved for obedience. And I hope you understand that. With the old covenant, we do good because we have to. Now, in the new covenant, because we want to. Then verse 11 is a rather interesting one. It says that no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Now, this verse does not mean that we don't need people to teach us. Now, as a pastor and teacher, it is my job to help you intellectually understand the word of God. I hope I'm doing a good job here. But I can't give you an experiential understanding of God because you have to get it yourself. And no one can tell you this is how you must feel or this is how you can experience God in your life. Every person is different in their own experiences. But tell you what, you can know God personally and intimately every day. And that is why all of us as believers in Christ can say, good morning, Holy Spirit. This is the hallmark of who we are in Christ. 
Not only can we know Him, we get to experience God as our Heavenly Father, Jesus as our friend and brother, and the Holy Spirit as our constant companion and helper. <laughs> Will you maybe please just pause right now and appreciate the implication of this truth? What an amazing truth. And we have just two verses left, verse 12. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Will remember their sins no more. Let's not rush this part too quickly. Take in a deep breath. Take in a deep breath and say it to yourself. God will remember my sins no more. Now say that to yourself again. God will remember my sins no more. You know, last Friday, in my visit to a cell group, a member asked me this question. You know, Pastor, I'm really uncomfortable when I read in Scripture that on Judgment Day, I will be called to account for all that I have done. You mean, Pastor, there will be a big TV screen showing all the good, the bad, and the ugly in my life? Why would God do that if I'm already saved? That's very embarrassing. And my simple reply is this. In my opinion, there's a simple answer to that. You will probably, probably be horrified to notice that there are more bad than good in your life, right? Not just the things you do, but all the thoughts that were going through your mind, which nobody knows about. An angry thought, a lustful thought, a selfish or self-glorifying thought. In fact, you may increasingly get agitated by what you see about yourself. Then at the end of that video, you know what? God looks at you smilingly. He will smile at you. And gently, He will say, I will remember your sins no more. I will remember your sins no more. So how do you think you will feel like as a sister? And this was she said. I think, Pastor, I will cry and cry and cry. And I ask her, why do you think you will cry and cry? Because I probably will realize that in spite of all the wrongs I have done, I am totally forgiven. And I will maybe for the first time truly understand the divine grace of God in my life. Something that I don't deserve, but He gives it to me anyway. You know, the late David Pawson told of a story when he was a pastor in a church. And let me quote. There was a Sunday when everyone had gone home after the service. But there was a little old lady sitting in the church all by herself, crying her heart out. I went and sat by her and asked what her problem was. She explained that years ago she did a dreadful thing and that if her family and friends knew about it, they would never speak to her again. And he said that for 30 years, she had been asking God to forgive her and God never had forgiven her. And I told her that the very first time she asked God, He would have forgiven her. He has forgiven her and He forgot about it. So for 30 years, God had not known what she was actually talking about. She told me she didn't believe it. So I took her through some scriptures which spoke of the new covenant and how God would no longer remember her sins. It took 20 minutes to convince her that God had forgotten all about it. She got up, and I couldn't believe my eyes, David Pawson wrote. She danced around the church. She was about 70 years old, and here she was, dancing around the church for sheer joy. God had forgotten it. See, our trouble is we cannot forget it, and so we struggle to forgive ourselves. Unquote. Is any one of you like this old lady? Let me end with verse 13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon 
disappear. So why go back to the old covenant, which is obsolete and outdated? Why go back to your old life? The new covenant is so much better. Jesus is so much better. The ultimate purpose of the old covenant was to point people to Christ. It was not enough to save them. The new covenant will. So here's the big idea again. It's finished. It's all done. Christ is enough. And let's come before God right now. Let's bow our heads. Now, if you're not a Christian, or you may have backslided, you are certainly not here by chance, but by the divine appointment of God for your life. Isn't it amazing to discover that you cannot save yourself? Jesus has done it all for you. You simply need to accept what Jesus has done on the cross and begin this journey. So if you so desire, you can follow me in this simple prayer to begin your journey in the new covenant. And if that's you, will you follow with me in this simple prayer in your hearts? Right, together. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for letting things mess up my life, which you call sins. Sin is running my life without you. I confess these things to you. Teach me to repent from them. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, so that my sins can be forgiven. Today, I receive your forgiveness and invite you to come into my life. I want to begin the journey of faith into eternal rest with you and make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Now, if you have said that prayer, congratulations, because you have just begun a journey with Jesus. Now, it would be very helpful for us if you can, on the chat screen, click that button called Raise Hands. Or on the, the front of the screen where there's a QR code, could you take a photo of that? And a form will pop up to you. And could you fill in the details so that we can follow up with you with some of the things to help you grow in your Christian faith. So thank you for uh, doing that uh, for us. And uh, so, you know, we want to pray and just close in prayer to ask that God will help us understand the new covenant in a much greater way. So that it help us to recognize the grace of God over us. And so whatever your needs are today, will you just come to the Lord to recognize that He has done it all for us. And all we need to do is a drink for that stream of living water. Let's all bow our heads and receive a prayer and a benediction at the end. Holy Spirit, please show to us the beauty and glory of why Jesus is better than anything else in this world. Help us rejoice that there's nothing we need to do to make you love us more. Jesus has done it all. I simply ask that everyone in this room will experience the freedom and liberty we can have in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. From this posture, teach us to love you and serve you more. May we learn to trust in Jesus in every area of our lives especially that area of our lives where we are worried and concerned about. Indeed, we take comfort that Jesus is more than enough. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of His Spirit be with us both now and evermore. Amen. So thank you for joining us, and we will see you next weekend. God bless you.